short-term fellow here before, working on the open vaults that some of you might have seen downstairs. Uh, and uh, so Jonathan tells us, oh, you should absolutely have Blaise at the network seminar. He's a fantastic person. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and so, so we planned for a seminar some months ago, and there was a free uh, discovery days. So it's been changed to two days, so unfortunately Jonathan couldn't be here. And so Blaise is at Ecole Polytechnique and he, he's basically studying bacteria swimming uh, around the place and co well, active fluids, collective motion. Yeah. Uh, and so the floor is yours. Uh, it's usually 40 minutes of speech plus 20 minute discussion and it's gonna be, I think, a okay. bit uh, fluid. Yeah, don't hesitate to interrupt me, okay, to talk. Uh, that's perfectly fine. Uh, so yeah, I, I've been working at Ecole Polytechnique for a year now. I'm a CNRS Research Fellow. Uh, since last year uh, at Ladix, which is the laboratoire hydrodynamic de l'école polytechnique, where we mostly uh, work on fluid dynamics. And one of the things that I like in fluid dynamics is mostly suspensions, that is basically particles disseminated in a liquid. And recently I've been working on active fluids. Um, and before I forget to mention them, I would like to mention my collaborators. Uh, so Michelle is a professor at Northwestern University. Uh, she did most of the experiments that you will see. Uh, Alex is a mathematician and professor at the Swan Institute of Mathematical Sciences, where I did uh, some of my uh, studies at uh, NYU. And Paul Chaikin is a soft matter physicist uh, working at NYU in Princeton at the same time. And basically together we uh, uncover basically new physics with active fluids that I'm going to detail. But first I want to give some background, because I, I guess most of you have very heterogeneous background. Uh, and I want to define what are these collective effects and what is an active fluid. So, well, I guess most of you have seen this kind of uh, videos, I guess, of what is collective motion in nature. Uh, and you may have seen uh, this video or by your eyes, uh, what is the collective motion of starlings of birds, uh, which is pretty impressive, actually. Uh, you see these flocks uh, of birds, uh, maybe with thousands or thousands, tens of thousands of birds, uh, exhibiting uh, coherent motion at scales that are much larger than one individual. And the same is true on the water, of course, where you have these huge uh, schools uh, of fish as well. When again, you have tens of thousands of individuals uh, exhibiting some kind of collective motion at very large scale. And this is true for many species, actually, uh, in, uh, on Earth, uh, both insects, uh, but also human beings. Uh, so some of you are working on crowds, uh, but also cattle and well, animals in general. And now the next question is, can that happen uh, well at, for, at smaller scales? And here I'm going to show you a movie where we do see some collective motion. And I want you to maybe try to guess what we're looking at. Do you have some ideas of what this video might be uh, representing? Uh, Boiling water in the beginning before it boils. No. no. It looks like a turbulent pattern. Like a smoke? Uh, no. What? Like a smoke? No, not smoke. No. Is it like acting? Not acting. No, said microtubules or acting matter, I guess. It's like swarming motion of some small... Exactly. It's like this is ram sperm. Oh, I was going to say. I didn't want to say it, I was going to say it. I was thinking a lot. <laughs> so one of my very good friends when I did my PhD in the south of France in Toulouse while working, while was working on that. Um, mostly he worked with biology people, basically they tried to correlate uh, mammal fertility with uh, active motion basically and they have shown that the more turbulent uh, the suspension of sperm is the more uh, fertile is the sample uh, that's something that uh, is quite interesting and something just to, get to give you uh, orders of magnitude uh, this box is only two millimeter uh, in size and one sperm cell is only 60 micron okay so this is really collective motion at, mic at the micron scale and so if you summarize, basically in one of these box, you have uh, 25,000 sperm cells. And one of these ever uh, evolving structure only uh, um, contains at least 1,000 cells. So again, this is collective motion where the coherent structures are much bigger than one individual, like the flock of starlings. Uh, but what is uh, most interesting here is that sperm cells have no eyes, no brain, no sensors. Uh, this is purely deterministic, purely mechanical collective motion. Okay? And the whole of, all of that in, uh, basically is mediated through the fluid that surrounds the sperm cells. The sperm cells are basically beating in a viscous liquid. 
and the disturbances they create on the liquid will drive this collective motion. Um, so now, well, let me define more in more details what is an active fluid now that you have some, some insights. So if you say that this is an active fluid, uh, it's basically made of fluid, like water or any kind of fluid you want. For sperm cells, it's uh, the seminal liquid. And in the fluid, you have these small motile active particles that can move by themselves, that are self-propelled uh, in the fluid. What is extremely important to know is that these particles are really small and at the micron scale, basically, when a particle moves in a fluid, it's going to disturb the fluid and the disturbances that it creates decay very slowly. Okay? And that's the major difference with us. If I walk basically past Mark, you won't feel any of the disturbances that I created in the air or maybe very slight disturbances. But if you were both of us walking in honey, for instance, you will feel my disturbances even a few meters away. Basically, it means that the disturbances you create in the fluid are long range. Okay? They decay like one over the distance. Okay? So it's really easy to feel the, pre the presence of other particles inside. Oh, but is that just a consequence of it being small? Or yeah, and going slow. It depends upon the fluid. <coughs> so it depends on, yeah, on the fluid viscosity. Yeah. Uh, so there is a di dimensionless number that I didn't want to introduce, which is called the Reynolds mm -hmm. number. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I just wanted to, uh, to, well, to go, I didn't want to go into the details uh, to make it understandable to everyone. But what's the Reynolds number? So you hear it's 10 to the minus 5. Oh, well, yeah. very, very, very yeah. small. Yeah. And honey, how much is it, honey? So, for, I don't know the viscosity of honey. I was just saying that if I walk slowly in honey, my Reynolds number would be basically 10 to the minus 2, I guess. Okay. Uh, so basically, overdent dynamic. Okay. Long range dynamic interactions. And so these active units uh, can be either biological, uh, it can be any kind of plankton, uh, bacteria, uh, well, any virus, microorganism that can self-propel motile cells, like sperm cells that you've seen, or uh, tissue cells also that can crawl mm. in liquids, uh, but also synthetic particles. Mm. And that's something that has been, uh, well, that, that has fascinated many physicists and fluid mechanics people. Uh, we basically, we see what happens in nature, we are amazed, and then we try to reproduce that in the lab and in our uh, computer codes. And so people have designed catalytic particles, basically that can react with the fluid and generate uh, flow, uh, velocity on their surface and then self-propel. Uh, and people have also been using uh, colloidal particles, for instance, uh, using magnetic uh, magnets to make them move. And so the questions we want to answer is, well, with these synthetic particles, can we uh, understand then the dynamics of active fluids? Can we control it? and uh, to what extent and what kind of applications can we have in mind using these, act these active fluids. Okay, and basically most of my talk will be focused on these kind of synthetic particles where uh, magnetic uh, interactions, uh, no, not magnetic interactions, but magnetic driving is used to generate collective motion. So that's basically my introduction to give you a general background. Uh, and to, basically I want you to understand that dynamic interactions at these scales are extremely important and that's why people doing fluid dynamics are interested in these kind of systems. Okay, so I wanted to start with the fundamentals of rotating particles in liquids, okay? So if you take one very small particle that is spinning in a liquid far from any boundary, okay? So consider that as an unbounded liquid. Uh, so tau is the rate of rotation, or the torque if you want, if you do mechanics. And y basically tells you the direction of rotation. So basically, this is the x direction, the z direction, uh, and y goes out of the screen, basically. And once uh, this particle rotates, since we are very viscous, uh, the flow is very simple. This is a simple analytical solution, okay? So here you see the velocity field induced by this small particle. Uh, so the flow is purely axisymmetric, okay? The streamlines, okay? The velocity vectors are basically purely uh, circular. And we can calculate this, the magnitude of this velocity pretty easily, and it decays like one over the distance squared from the rotating particle. So simply if you say now, if I take two of these particles, so I place a neighbor here with the same rotation rate, okay, now I will just have a combination of these two flows, okay, and basically, regardless of their initial distance, these two particles uh, will rotate, uh, okay, we have what we call a periodic trajectory, periodic orbit, if you like, the dynamical systems. Uh, and we can compute analytically the rotation period, okay. Okay, so that's for particles rotating, rotating far from any boundary. Now what happens if you have a boundary? So now uh, I have no longer 
Uh, and Monday 3, I just have a floor here, so where the fluid cannot penetrate and cannot move, basically it's touching the floor. Uh, and now if the particle rotates above the boundary, the flow that it creates is no longer axisymmetric. Okay? Uh, and you see basically two regions. One where the streamlines are closed, which means that the fluid is trapped, you have a recirculation zone, and one where the streamlines are open, which means that the fluid flow from the left to the right. And then down and up here. Again, if you put a second particle at a given horizontal distance x, okay, and one two just say distance between particle one and particle two, and zc is the height of the geometric center of the two particles, okay, then the question is, are we going to have periodic orbits or not? Okay, how did the combination of these two flow will give me periodic orbits or not? So here is a simple uh, movie basically where I put these two particles above the floor, again the floor is at z equals 0, okay? And I choose an initial separation uh, at 2.356 times the initial height of the system. And as soon as they start rotating, they start self-propelling, okay? I do have, uh, well, this is collective motion, but with only two particles. Uh, and I do see that they move, they are self-propelled, and I have a periodic orbit that replicates itself uh, infinitely. But then, if I just increase the initial separation by one thousandth, so almost nothing, then they diverge away from each other. Okay, which means that here, by slightly changing the initial conditions, I can either have collective motion periodic orbits, or basically two particles getting away from each other. Close like covariance. Yeah, so if you like dynamical systems, I'm not going to talk too much about dynamical mm -hmm. systems, but uh, we can talk uh, after about that. I, I studied that system from a dynamical system perspective. That's that, these are the only dynamical system equations that I wrote. Uh, basically, these are the equations of motion for uh, the pair of particles. Okay? Here I did some transformations. I used translational invariance, etc. But basically, what you need to read from that is that we have only three degrees of freedom. Uh, basically, the horizontal separation between the particles, the vertical separation between the particles, and the evolution of the height of the geometric center between the particles. Uh, and that's very convenient because the phase space only has three dimensions, so you can visualize everything and find the fixed point, etc. Um, and so you can here see the phase space. Uh, that looks, may, may look familiar to some of you to the pendulum or anything like that. Except for the pendulum, uh, this is replicated many times. Here, this is not the case. Uh, what you can see here in phase space is the, so this is the horizontal separation versus the vertical separations between the two particles. All the colored trajectories are the periodic orbits, where the two particles uh, move and, uh, uh, and rotate upon each other. And the color is just uh, the, the, the length of the period, okay? So the closer they are together, the faster it goes. And the, all the uh, red, uh, sorry, gray trajectories are diverging tra trajectories, okay? You can say much more about that, but I will skip it. Um, all I can say is that basically the two movies I showed you one movie is slightly on the left of this separ separatrix, of this point here, and one other movie is slightly on the right. So basically this point here is the point where I'm at the boundary between periodic and unstable orbits. Okay. Do you also study some you know, stable manifolds here? Or so that, that's what I'm trying to do right now. We can talk about that later if you want. Mm -hmm. um, because I think we can have an analytic description of the unstable manifolds. Uh, but I have some technical issues that we can uh, talk together. Okay, so just to tell you, it's just an introduction, uh, a teaser to tell you that with just two spinning particles above a boundary, we already, we already have some rich dynamics. Uh, so then what happens if you have many, many of them, okay? Uh, and that's what I was interested in during uh, the last two years uh, with my collaborators in the US. So now, uh, instead of having two simple particles rotating above a boundary, I have tens of thousands of them, okay? So I'm going to explain you what you're seeing here. So these are particles that are sedimented to the bottom boundary, okay? The, the gray plane is the floor, okay? And here there is gravity, which I didn't include in my previous example. So here the particles are basically denser than the fluid, and since they are denser, they're going to sediment down on the boundary. They don't exactly touch it because there is some brilliant motion, okay? So they may, they may jiggle around above the boundary. And then they rotate about this direction of rotation, okay? And so uh, the color here uh, basically gives you the um, translational speed 
Okay, so basically the brighter the particle is, the faster it goes into this direction. And the black particles are just normal particles, except that I color them in black to follow the motion, basically. So basically the, the black particles have nothing special in them. Um, and once we start rotating them, Not only we see some collective motion, but then we see some spontaneous self-assembly of the particles. Oh. Where did you do that? In which uh, software? So that's a, a code that I wrote. Uh, so I, my, basically my, my, my job is mostly to develop numerical methods. Um, so I work with applied mathematicians to develop numerical methods. And then I try to, to use them with physicists. The so visualization software? Is uh, it's para, para view is called. Paraview is a, is a okay. open source software for 3D rendering of oh, okay. mm -hmm. fields. And, and that's a code that I wrote in, uh, on GPUs, which makes it very, very fast. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, and so now the question we can ask, so you, you saw basically that there was some kind of transient motion instabilities, and then from this instability, we saw these big clusters that we call colloidal creatures, because these are creatures made of hundreds of thousands of very small particles. And now the questions we want to ask are, are how did they form? Uh, are they real or is this just me playing around with, with simulations because that's an important question and next what can we do with them okay so now let's go to the lab uh, just to make sure I was not fooling around so in the lab uh, our rollers we call that rollers or spinners I mean the, the name are just rotating particles are very small particles again uh, so if you call a the radius of this particle the radius is about half a micron in size which is really small and again Due to the effect of uh, thermal fluctuations, of Brownian motion, if you will, uh, these particles are so small that they jiggle around, okay, and their mean height above the floor is one micron. So they never touch the floor exactly, okay? Uh, they have a mean height which is half a radius away from the floor, basically. So these particles are here, sedimented above the floor, jiggling around. They are made of plastic, basically, polymer, and inside we put a small magnet. Okay, very small magnets, small cube, that will help us to make them rotate. Mm. Uh, so these particles are in a microfluidic chamber, and all basically all the dimensions of this microfluidic, microfluidic chamber are much bigger than the particle size. So basically you can really see these particles are spinning above a half plane in a semi-unbounded semi fluid. Okay? Um, and the way we make them rotate, this is my best animation, <laughs> uh, is by spinning a magnetic field, okay, so that's a magnetic field B, that's we spin about the y-axis, and thanks to the moment of the magnet inside the particle, it will rotate in synchrony with the magnetic field, mm -hmm. okay. So this is as simple as that. Mm -hmm. uh, and here I want to emphasize that there is no magnetic interactions, okay, uh, there is dimensionless number again that, that compares viscous hieratic interactions to magnetic interactions, and magnetic interactions are negligible compared to hydrodynamic interactions. So all what we're going to see here is purely due to hydrodynamics between the particles. Okay, so again, back to the basics, we know that the flow field about a particle in the unbounded fluid is axisymmetric. Okay, and tau again is the rate of rotation. And now, something important to notice also is that the flow is axisymmetric. In a, in a section that is perpendicular to the axis of rotation, but then if you look in the plane of the axis of rotation, there is no flow. Okay, try to understand what I'm saying. Uh, this is so. This is my model rotating. The axis of rotation is this one. Okay, so this is the velocity in the plane that is perpendicular to the axis of rotation, and here this is the velocity in the plane parallel to the axis of rotation. So like that, my model is rotating like that. Okay, and there is no flow. Okay, but now when you put that finite particle uh, close to the boundary, again, you have these uh, closed and open streamlines that I showed earlier. Okay, uh, here the solution is a bit more complex because the, the, the resolution of my solution is higher. Something important as well to notice is that the particle has a self-induced velocity v naught. Okay, if you put a single particle rotating above a boundary, it's going to move by itself. Okay, without any neighbor. Uh, uh, close to it. This is due to the uh, what we call drag on its surface, but it's purely fluid mechanics. And now, uh, in the plane that contains the axis of rotation, we have transverse flows. Okay, and this is due again to the fact that we have a boundary below the particle. And one other thing you must notice that is extremely important is that 
at the typical height of the particles, the velocity is V0, okay? <coughs> but now we know that the velocity on the particle surface is the rigid body motion, okay? This is because the fluid cannot slip on the particle. And basically, the ve fluid velocity here is 60 times V0. And here, what I'm showing you, basically, the color scale is the fluid velocity rescaled by V0. Which means that even if I am, let's say, 10 radii away from the particle, mm. the velocity is still 5 to 10 times the self-induced velocity V0. So it means that if I put a neighbor here, the pair is going to go 5 times faster than, than, if, than if the particle is, is, is alone. So that's where collective effects are very important. Okay? So that's something you can quantify in experiments as well. So what I'm showing you here uh, is an experiment that is seen from above. Okay, that's uh, taken for, with a microscope, of course. So again, the axis of rotation is the y-axis here. Particles move in the x direction, okay? And we see them from above. Um, and basically, you can see that the more the particles, the faster uh, the suspension goes, basically, okay? Here you have only a few particles, they go very slowly, and as you increase the area fraction, which is the number of particles per unit surface, if you will, uh, then you see that the speed is much uh, larger. And these collective effects are extremely strong, extremely robust. Where do you have the magnetic field come from? Like so the magnetic field is rotating about the y-axis. Okay, so it's pushing it like this. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So that's something you can quantify. Okay. So here what I'm showing you is the collective velocity versus the area fraction of particles. Okay. Um, and here, that's for many different, uh, for yeah, a few different uh, rotational frequency of the of the magnetic field. Okay, but basically, the, the take-home message here is that uh, the uh, collective velocity scales linearly with the area fraction of particles with a large refactor here. So indeed, uh, the more you put particles, the much faster uh, you go. Okay, so that's for a nice uniform suspension. Okay, here you see that basically the. Uh, microlers are uniformly seeded on the surface. Okay, then what happens if you start uh, with a strip? And now we are getting closer to my initial movie you've seen. Uh, so now we are seeing the experiments here. We see the particles from the top, uh, and what we have done is that we have pushed all the particles on one side of the chamber. Okay, so they form a uniform strip here. We see them from from above. The again the rotation. Uh, is about the y-axis and they're going to move along the x-direction when, when I'm going to start rotating them. And so as soon as you start rotating them, you get an instability with these fingers that mm -hmm. are generated. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically here I'm trying to, I'm just describing what, we, what you've seen. We start with uniform strip, we get a front, a dense front, okay? I don't have much time to give you details about the front. Uh, this is rather technical, but if you have questions, uh, we'd be happy to talk about that. The front becomes unstable, so this is a linear instability. So for some, those of you who are interested, I can also give the details about this instability. Uh, and then we have these fingers developing as a consequence of this transverse instability. And of course, the question you want to answer is what sets the finger size? How do we, can we, can we predict the size uh, of these fingers, the, the width of these fingers? Uh, so that's why, that's where uh, numerical simulations are very uh, useful and effective because changing the, exploring the parameter space is really hard in experiments. It's really hard to change one parameter without changing the other. While in numerical simulations, it's just about uh, changing uh, a coefficient in our, uh, in our code. So basically I developed a code when I was at the Courant Institute in, in New York uh, what basically can reproduce uh, this kind of system where we have thousands of particles rotating above uh, a floor and interacting through hydrodynamic interactions uh, and excluded volumes, of course, they cannot overlap. Uh, and here is an example of a movie taken from above where we see basically the same features where we get the dense front, the dense front uh, becomes unstable and uh, then we see the fingers uh, growing. Uh -huh. uh, it's like... Um when the rain uh, slip over a window, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, do, do you think yeah, there is a leak? Because it's a surface tension. Like, I mean, you exactly. Have yeah. like so th there is a big difference between these two systems. Is that in my in my in my case, the, what, let's say that the uh, the suspension with the microrollers uh, is a fluid. Okay. Uh, 
in my case, so let's say here we have water, here we have the active fluid, and these two fluids are miscible. They can mix together. And that's not the case for uh, water and air, which are immiscible where you have surface tension. Basically, uh, if you have a, a bubble or a, or a drop of air, it wants to be spherical. And, and basically, this, this uh, raindrops that you see on the, on the rain shield uh, when you drive, for instance, are mostly due to surface tension versus gravity. Here, the mechanism is completely different. Okay, and there is a rotation that's the dynamic uh, of, the, of what we see. Exactly, uh, so, yeah. yes, go ahead. And, uh, and for the rain, it's, the, it's just a gravity. Gravity, exactly. Okay. Here, basically, gravity is going inside the screen, so it has no effect yeah. on the dynamics of the system, except that it sets the, the mean height of the particles above the floor. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, here, the driving force, if you will, is the rotation mm -hmm. rate. Okay. Uh, and so, so, thank you for your question, because indeed, uh, the question is what sets the finger size? Uh, and so, basically, in the experiments, they tried many things. They tried changing the fluid viscosity, they tried changing the rotation rate, and none of these uh, seemed to affect the wavelength of the instability, the finger size. Um, and basically, what we've, what we've shown is that uh, what changes the uh, size of the fingers is the mean height of the particles above the floor. Uh, so basically, what we've done in some of the simulations, which is something you cannot do in experiment, and that's because it's not physical, we have constrained the particles to remain in a plane above the floor. Okay, okay, that's purely uh, abstract here, but it's very important to understand the mechanisms at play. Uh, so here, what we've done is so we constrain the particles to rotate about at the at 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 height h above the floor, and then we look at the dynamics. Uh, and what what you're going to see here are two movies. Sorry, the quality is really bad. Uh, so these are two movies, two different simulations, but played at the same time. So the blue particles are three radii away from the floor, and the red particles are six radii away from the floor, so further away from the floor. And so when you play the two movies at the same time, then you learn uh, what is the control parameter. Okay. So basically what you can see is that the blue particles form fingers that are twice thinner than the red particles, <coughs> okay? And what really sets the finger size in the end is the height of the floor. And that's something you can explain if you understand well Stokes' flow. In Stokes' flow, so in the limit where the Reynolds number is zero, everything is purely geometric because you solve a sequence of quasi-static uh, states. Uh, and everything is dictated by the boundary conditions, uh, if you will. Uh, and then you can explain that, okay? If you have more questions, I can, I can, I can, uh, I can answer them. Uh, but basically, that's the control parameter, is it's the height. And another thing that you learn is that basically this instability is planar. Okay? The fact that you rotate and ha have this uh, leap of motion in the z direction is not that important to understand the transverse instability. Um, and that's, that's, for instance, a graph where you see two of these uh, points on the, on the graph. And basically, it tells you that the wavelength is controlled by the height. Uh, and that's something we have, uh, we have checked in the experiments. Um, so what we have done is that, so this is the same movie as before, where the mean height of the particles is one micron away from the floor, okay, due to the competition between Brownian motion and gravity. And in this movie, basically, the particles are less heavy, or if you will, the fluid is denser, so gravity is less effective, is, is, is weaker, okay. Uh, and what you can see is that, indeed, when the particles are higher on average, the size of the structure is much bigger. So again, the finger size is controlled by the particle height. Okay, and we can talk about the details. Uh, so I've, done, I've developed a continuum model and the theory for that. Um, but here I'm just talking about the main results. Uh, we're not going to details. Okay, uh, what about these big ratios I showed you in the beginning? Because here I'm not explaining everything. Uh, so we know that we can have fingers, and now if we look at the flow uh, around the fingertip. We see that the flow is, is, is kind of specific because, so this is the flow, uh, the fluid velocity in the frame moving with the fingertip. Okay, so here I'm in the fingertip and I'm just looking at the fluid velocity around me. And what you see is that many streamlines are recirculating, which means that the particles that are trapped in this region will stay in this region. Okay. So that explains why the fingertips can break off from the rest of the suspension. Okay. 
Uh, and this is a kind of hydraulic attraction that has not been noticed before, so that's what we were quite surprised about, is that this is very generic due to hydraulic interactions. And this is due to the fact that, again, remember, a micro, uh, one of these spinning particles generate transverse flows in the plane parallel to the floor. Okay, that's something you don't see if you don't have uh, a floor below the particle. So again, this is a cut parallel to the floor. Okay, so the floor is below. Uh, the particles are rotating about this axis, moving in this direction, mm -hmm. and each of them generates a transverse uh, velocity field. Mm -hmm. And if you look in the frame of, of this collective cluster, it becomes a recirculating zone. So you have that, you have this hydraulic attraction, okay? And you also have... I'm trying to build yeah, go ahead. I'm trying to build intuition, so it's all turning like that, and the higher density region is attracted towards the lower density region. So, so do you create this thing towards the lower density region in the particle? I'm trying to feel of like how, how you create this. This, this, this recirculating motion? Yeah. So let me, let me go back, uh, let me go back to this simple like this scheme intuition. here. Yes, this one. Okay. Okay, so that's the velocity field about one particle parallel to the floor. Okay. So, so if you put many of them, here, and go in the frame <coughs> of the moving cluster. Okay, so right now you're turning in y along the y axis. Yes. Along the y axis. Y axis, okay, like that. Okay. Do something like that, so it's going this. So yeah. right now it's going straight, but if you couple that, <coughs> so what you're saying is because of the kind of diverging lines. Diverging lines, exactly. This transverse flow, it sucks fluid from the rear and expels it at the front. So that will create, okay, so that's And that, okay. if you remove okay. basically okay. V0, if you take this field minus V0, yeah. okay, you're gonna get something that is recirculating. Uh, uh, uh. If V0 is big enough, okay. okay? For a single particle, you don't have that, but if you have many of them, because of the collective uh, translational uh, speed. So you're gonna show a critical threshold where that begins to be recirculating and... Uh, so I, I don't show it here, okay. but I'm showing another threshold. Mm -hmm. uh. So you have that, okay? Basically, once you're in a cluster, because of this recirculating region, you're gonna stay in a cluster, at least in the plane. But then you also have this leapfrog motion, remember? Uh, when you rotate about the y-axis, you generate this flow. So if I put a neighbor here, okay, uh, this neighbor, due to gravity, wants to go down, okay? But because of the streamlines, because I apply a torque on that particle, okay, this particle will also have a red arrow, this red arrow is the fluid velocity, okay, at this location, okay? So basically, if I'm close to a neighbor that generates these strong flows that go upward, I'm able to beat gravity and have this leapfrog motion that we see in the movies, mm -hmm. okay? And there is actually a dimensionless number um, that basically compares this to effect that is this velocity that is induced by the neighbor over the gravity, mm -hmm. okay? And so when this number is really small, uh, I am gravity driven, all the particles settle, settle down on the floor and nothing happens, okay? And when this number is really high, everything is driven by the rotation. Gravity doesn't play any role. Okay, I'm just showing you a few movies. Uh, so for small values of this B number, the particles settle down on the floor and just, well, move together really fast, but they move together with a constant separation distance, okay? But as soon as my rotation is strong enough, I can beat gravity and start having this leapfrog motion, okay? And as you increase B, this leapfrog <coughs> motion becomes more and more is perfect. It, uh, 4 pi, the threshold, because 12 is mm -hmm. 4 pi. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it were. I wish it were. No. I don't know, like, four no. radiuses. No, 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 so again, I looked at this from a dynamic, from dynamical system perspective. This is very interesting. You have many uh, bifurcations, fixed points. Mm -hmm. that you, have, you have a hub bifurcation, actually. You have nucleation of fixed points. You have a limit. I mean, it's, uh, so just two particles is extremely rich already. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what I wanted to, to, uh, to emphasize here is that you really have a special value to see this leapfrog motion. So basically, you need to rotate fast enough to make sure that you're going to have these uh, ever-rotating uh, clusters. Okay. So now that you know that you have aerodynamic attraction in the plane, transverse, uh, parallel to the boundary, and this leapfrog motion, basically the combination of the two uh, help you understand better that movie, okay? Now I play the same movie you've seen at the beginning. 
And now that you understand most of the mechanisms that I, I, did, I did not explain all of them, but you know that you have aerodynamic attraction, okay? Transverse flows and you frog motion. And so if you, are, uh, if you like dynamical systems, then you're going to ask, is it an attractor of the system? Okay, is it really a stable state? Um, so what is really intriguing here is that indeed, let's fast forward the movie, mm -hmm. they seem to last forever. <laughs> There's no dissipation in here. I mean, well, the, uh, dissipation is compensated <laughs> by the external torque. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. right? You're, you're, you're using magnetic. This is an active fluid, so you have some power inputs, external uh -huh. power uh -huh. inputs here. Okay. Okay. Um, of course, if you only had gravity, nothing would happen. Everything would be at equilibrium and uh, wouldn't be interesting. Uh, but the fact that it is active uh, okay. and the fact that we have long range aerodynamic interaction generates uh, these clusters. <coughs> and, and, and what is also very interesting is that these clusters <coughs> are going extremely fast. Um, <coughs> So here I'm comparing the cluster velocity over the self-induced velocity for one microroller, okay? And you can see that basically a cluster goes about 10 times, uh, 10,000 times faster than a single particle. And again, this is because we have the sum of thousands of very strong advective flows, okay? Remember, one microroller generates very strong flows. And the sum of all these flows generates very fast tentrating motion on the surface of the rudder. Okay, and this very fast slip, basically velocity on the rudder, makes it propel extremely fast. And how does it scale with the number of uh, elements in the cluster? So, I will r rather show you movies that are uh, from. A, I, I did some continuum simulations of that, from a ma macroscopic scale, uh, and that will give you a better better answer. Yeah. Because here, the number of particles depends on the initial conditions, uh, on the initial arrangement that you choose. Uh, why, if you use a continuum model, everything is purely uh, well, not I mean, the chaos here. This is a chaotic system, right? Uh, and so, I, I will show you some some uh, some continuum model that will answer better the question. Uh, so again, that's that's uh, also the flow field, but not the flow field parallel to the boundary, but perpendicular to the boundary. Okay. So the boundary again is at z or zero. Okay. Everything is rescaled by the, by the particle waves. Um, and so I can give you here a first uh, insight is that uh, the fluid velocity is much faster on the top than on the bottom, okay? Because here we have a boundary that dissipates